Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about season four, episode 21, The Death of Crockett. I mean, deliver us from evil because, you know, he didn't die last week. No, he didn't. <laughs> why, were you, why do you sound disappointed? <laughs> He seemed awful health, healthy in this episode. Like, like nothing, you nothing did, was bothering him. John did predict it. He said last week in the last show that he's like, I bet you're not even going to talk about it. And they didn't say anything about it. It was not brought up at all. No. Not it, even you know, like, it's like where he was, was Caitlin just, <laughs> while you were being shot. It's like he was never shot, shot in the chest. Like, oh. I'm going to bring that up later. It talks about timelines. Yes. How much time has passed in it estimate how much time it took for Sunny to heal <laughs> yeah <laughs> and how long has Caitlin been gone yeah <laughs> so some we'll math doesn't add up that one. <laughs> I, am, I am seriously starting to wonder have they spent more than two days together in their marriage like yeah I, how many days I, married versus apart ha- have we been here now <laughs> they're negative yeah. actually now <laughs> Yeah, because, I mean, right after they got married, like, at the end of that episode, she goes to Europe, and then she doesn't come back. Well, this episode is titled Deliver Us From Evil. It's the first of a two-parter to end the season, and Sunny Amnesia is next week. Spoiler! We gotta get there first. <laughs> this episode premiered on April 29th, 1988. It is written by Dick Wolf. I'm, No surprise. <laughs> the director is George Mendeluk. We just saw him. He directed the episode Blood and Roses. That one and this one are the only ones that he directed, so he's back for this episode. Hmm. Before we get started, can check in, see what's going on each other's lives. Guys, we'd like to check in with the Vice team, see what they're up to. We've checked in with Don Johnson recently. He's going to be in that Watchmen TV show, which, by the way, just added Jeremy Irons. I'm on. I'm ready. Let's go. (laughs) (laughs) We talked about Dad. We talked about Castillo. Ever James almost a few months ago now that he made a surprise short appearance appearance in Coco. Mm-hmm. Well, guess what? He's back. He's going to be in the new FX show titled Mayans MC, which will come out this fall on FX, which is a spinoff of Sons of Anarchy. And if history has shown anything, he will probably be in a Ron Perlman type role. Yes, I think which so. Is unbelievable mm-hmm. that we'll get ever james almost in that kind of role yeah i'm, I'm actually kind of excited for this show because i think toward the end of sons of anarchy things got really dark i think this mind show is going to get a little bit back toward what brought people into sons of anarchy in the first few seasons be a little bit more about the club itself and a little bit less cynical i guess would be the best way to put it well it is from the same creator yeah, as Sons of Anarchy. So it's the same team that's going to be behind it. It's a spinoff of the show. So they're in the same universe. There are going to be a lot, some crossover and events that will happen. So if you're a fan of Sons of Anarchy, like they just dropped you into the same universe with a new story. Yep, exactly. That's exactly what they did. The reason why I say less cynical is that the club, the Mayans, were almost like the little brothers of the Sons of Anarchy. I saw that when they cast the main characters, they're very young in their 20s, like barely 20. So it's, I think that's well. Speaking of scenarios where dad is uncomfortable, like he will be <laughs> with a young gang, being in charge of a young gang, he's uncomfortable in this episode because he's got to look at Sunny and say, Please don't go do anything crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler, it doesn't work. <laughs> and he doesn't actually say anything either. So let's go break down this week's episode because no. this is a good one. Previously on Miami Vice. <laughs> that was a very long previously, just for the record. <laughs> hey, it got us to forgive us our debts in a three minute montage. If they could have shown the original in that time <laughs> frame, been... like, we got through the whole story. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it reminded us that you don't want to be an ex partner of Sonny Crockett because you would probably be murdered. <laughs> He does have a bad track record. So just a reminder, this is a flashback to what happened in the previous Frank Hackman storyline, which was season three, episode 11, Forgive Us Our Debts. We all remember that episode, right? Where Sonny gets a guilty man off of death row. And For killing go- his friend. No less. We had a lot of fun with that episode, <laughs> too. We make fun of Stan for knowing where to look because he knows where all the restaurants are. <laughs> <laughs> Sonny sneaks into a federal witness's house and beats him up and almost drowns him in the pool. And then it turns out that that man was also working for a hackman to get him out of jail. Yep. Turns out they all played him. 
and it worked. Start the episode with Hackman back to his old tricks. It's two years in the future. So what we see in the previous on Vice, which is a weird deal because it's from the previous season, not the previous episode, which would have made more sense because when you saw previously on Vice, you would think you would see Sonny getting shot. Nope. But instead, you see Hackman from more than a year earlier. Sonny never got shot. What are you talking about? <laughs> that never even happened. That was all a flashback of a flashback within a flashback. <laughs> so which is more likely to be true than Trudy seeing the aliens in peanut butter or Sonny getting shot? I think the aliens in the peanut butter. <laughs> <laughs> so now we are. We're up to current time. We go to this house where a woman and a man are talking. Well, the man's not really paying attention. The woman is showing him different dresses. They live in a very, very big house. This house looks familiar. We've seen many robberies in this home. <laughs> this poor house has been traumatized. <laughs> a masked man comes in. He's got them at gunpoint with a shotgun. Then two other men come in, and the mask looks exactly the same as it did in Forgive Us Our Debts for the per- person who killed Frankel, Sonny's former partner. And the voice sounds the same, too. Hmm. It was a good work. ski mask. I throw out a good ski mask. <laughs> <laughs> The man comes running over, tries to run past Hackman. He hits him with a shotgun. Then pull shotgun, shoots him. Then pulls out a handgun, shoots the man twice and kills him. Then shoots the woman, kills her all while their teenager was watching. We pan out to outside the house as we see Hackman walk up the stairs and we hear a gunshot. The whole family has been killed. And then we go to the opening credits. So it doesn't get any darker than this. Not just for Miami Vice, but on TV. We have the previous episode of Hackman where he gets off of death row to murdering an entire family. The man that Sonny got off of death row now just murdered an entire family. For the record, that was not their daughter. That was their niece. They said that at the <laughs> at the medical examiner's. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, he was her uncle. Which we so never found uncle. out <laughs> why they wanted to kill them. They had diamonds or some gems or something. Yeah, we find out later Wait, that... Was that the motive? I don't know why they killed them, but I know that's why they broke in. Because they had high-end like diamonds or gems. And they couldn't do that with them gone? Like They had to do that why. with them there? Yeah. That, that I didn't get. Like, why did they break in while they were there? Why not come when they're not there? Like, I also told Dominic, like, why would he do this if he's been out of pri- Like, he got off. Why would you go? Why you run death row. In, in Miami. <laughs> yeah, why come back to Miami? Just why do this else? in Miami? Why break the window? Like, I didn't understand everything that was happening because we find out later that it was a very pro job. They cut the phone lines. They took mm-hmm. the, the distributor cap off the car. Like, it was a thoroughly thought through hit because they only took the most expensive stuff. Too. Yeah. So it's still a total mystery why they murdered the entire family. And we also find out later that Hackman uses the shotgun and then he uses the 380, the different gun, the handgun. And Sonny even says, like, in 20 years of being a cop, I've only seen that once. Yeah, so why go to Sonny? So he pretty much uses his signature. (laughs) It's like he's just rubbing it in. Well, this is our spot to check in with the guest stars, and a lot of them are going to sound very familiar because this is a continuation of the Hackman storyline that we've complained before, especially even earlier this season with the Frank Mosca story where we felt like the continuation of the story was unnecessary. We knew back in Forgive Us Our Debts that this was coming, and man, have we been chomping at the bit to know what was going to happen with the Hackman storyline. So I am really looking forward to watching and breaking down this entire episode and that's why these guest stars are going to sound real familiar because it's a straight up part two of that storyline the sequel <laughs> so let's just jump right into it uh, let's start with frank hackman who we saw in forgive us our debts played by guy boyd like you mentioned he's the killer suddenly helped get free and he started in more than 50 films best known for his role as detective jim mclean in the movie body double from from 1984 he's also recently appeared as archbishop kurtwell in hbo drama the young pope interesting i was also scooping through all of his imbd credits i found it very interesting not for the movie but because i didn't know it existed he was also in an ewok adventure which was a tv movie in 1984 did you know they made a ewok tv movie Yes, Yes, I did. We have it. Yeah, the battle for Endor. (laughs) (laughs) I was not aware. So a couple more of those more recent movies. He was also in Blackbird, The Savages, and 2014's Foxcatcher. Two other ones, though, that caught my attention 
was he was in Dark Side of the Sun in 1988, which was Brad Pitt's first leading role. And then he was also in The Little Mermaid 1987, which was a live action movie version of The Little Mermaid. Which I also <laughs> didn't know existed. I didn't know that existed. <laughs> Our next guest star is Don Opper, who plays Johnny Blatt. He was an actor, writer, and producer. He was best known for his role as Charlie McFadden in the 1986 Critters. Yes. Yes. He actually was in all three sequels, but the original, he actually helped write. He wrote that <laughs> one. He appeared in a bunch of 80s TV shows, 80s and early 90s. He was in Quantum Leap, 21 Jump Street, Roseanne. And he actually got into show business. He worked as a clown, a puppeteer, and a bookstore, <laughs> a, a bookstore employee, and a grip. Before he got a job doing carpentry at Roger Corman's shop. So basically working building sets. And that's when he got a chance to make the movie Android, which he also wrote and starred in. Roger Corman does not get enough credit for starting people's careers. He would also write and act in the movie Slam Dance in 1987. <laughs> And the movie City Limits in 1984, uh, as well as some other movies. Those seem to be the most notable, though. <laughs> Those are the notable ones. <laughs> Next guest star is Julie Brams, who plays Hackman's wife. So aside from playing his wife in the previous episode, she also plays Sandy Dyson in the upcoming episode, Asian Cut. <laughs> and Rita Lombard in the episode World of Trouble. Spoiler. Oh, you don't know that? <laughs> no. Spoiler. This there's, there's another Lombard episode coming. Why are we talking about this one? Let's go watch the Lombard episode. I thought you knew. <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> it's a pretty big one, too. I just think it's funny that she, that she plays the bad guy's wife in two episodes. Different wives, obviously. <laughs> it makes me suspicious of what Sandy Dyson is involved in in Asian <laughs> Cut. <laughs> But aside from that, and I'm about 85% sure about this, I actually had to take a long look at the pictures, but <laughs> she is now a family marriage therapist in Encino, California. <laughs> Sleuth and John is back. <laughs> I doxed her Facebook <laughs> and I'm, I'm like pretty sure. <laughs> I called it. I called her. <laughs> We're just going to throw in here. Allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> Could Allegedly. How I will say, she looks suspiciously like a marriage and family <laughs> therapist in Encino, California with the same name. <laughs> our, last, our next guest star is Mary Fanaro, who plays Julie Adams. And she also plays a waitress in the episode Vote of Confidence. There's that. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> She was in a 1990 TV movie. I guess the name doesn't matter because no, none of us are going to go back and watch it. <laughs> uh, it stood out to me because she was in it with a bunch of other Vice guest stars. Other movies Mary is in is Given Sunday and Love, Cheat, and Steal. So she actually has a pretty good... Any Given Sunday was a big movie. Pretty much her claim to fame is that she's the founder of Omni Peace, which is a charity in L.A. that has done an, an incredible amount of good things in Africa, including building nine schools, a uh, safe haven for abused women and children in the Congo, and feeding over 10,000 families to one of the worst humanitarian crises in the past 60 years. She has funded that by throwing fancy parties with her friend Courtney Cox. Our last guest are some some woman named she she Shiana Yastin. <laughs> I, wait a minute, hold on. I think I know this name. It's Shrina Aston. I think that's what it is. <laughs> I, she looks vaguely familiar. Shenna Austin. <laughs> um, so, but she also has in the episode. So we'll talk about her more in music. <laughs> well, speaking of Shrina, when we come back from the opening credits, it's Kathleen Courtney. <laughs> Ky Kylie, Co Colleen, Colleen, Co Colleen, or whatever her name Caroline. is. Caroline. Caroline. Yeah. Oops. Whoops. <laughs> That's the wife he actually cared about. 
She's on the payphone talking to Sunny. She's going to be coming home soon. She's looking forward to being with her husband again. She also has something very I'm pretty sure important. she has pee. <laughs> she also has something very important to tell Sonny. So make sure he's available. He needs to clear a schedule. Yeah, he really make sure takes care of that. He's, you know, <laughs> and then they hang up the phone. The camera pans down. And she's holding her stomach. So she's got gas. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I told you she had to go to the bathroom. Did you see her bouncing up and down? <laughs> She wanted to tell him about it. <laughs> and when I first heard that, she's like, I got something I have to tell you when I come home. It's like, oh, that she was on this I, international I trip. Poop. <laughs> How many Germans did she sleep with while she was on the road? Like, <laughs> what kind of honesty are we going to be? I was like, oh, she's having a baby. Like, yeah. okay, I get it. Man, man, this has been a crazy three weeks. Like, he had all this stuff happen to him and he recovered from the shooting. And now she's seven weeks pregnant. <laughs> she's seven weeks. <laughs> How did that even happen? She, she's been in Europe for how long? Like a season and a half? So, I mean, exactly. it's been two years. She must be really fertile. It didn't take her long to get pregnant at all. At the precinct, there's Sunny. Literally as if nothing happened the week before. He's even got to speed up on the desk. And no one says anything. Like, good to have you back or nothing. No one says anything because it didn't <laughs> happen, you didn't I guess. Die. <laughs> <laughs> so this is where my real question is on timelines. She's seven weeks pregnant. She's been on a European and U.S. tour. And Sonny had his recovery. Yeah. So if you think about back, like, okay, this might be as old as 12 weeks when she would have gotten pregnant to be seven weeks pregnant, right? So yes. like somewhere between seven and 12 weeks is how long she's been gone. Yeah. Two to three months. Yeah. So how? How long does it take Sunny to recover to like nothing happened? It, yeah. I mean, it, it has to take more than a week, right? <laughs> <laughs> he got shot and it went, the bullet almost, it went to his spine. <laughs> I think it takes more than a week. <laughs> but maybe when a dermatologist uh, it, works on you, you get... <laughs> You get really <laughs> healed back. Tubbs comes over, checks on Sonny, says he's doing okay. They have a call from someone from Homicide. Uh? He's like, why are they calling us? <laughs> so they do a head over to the coroner's office. They go down and they see the family that had been killed. So the niece and then the the couple. No sign of drugs. Only things that were stolen were high value items. Sonny is immediately 12 gauge shotgun and another gun fired. And a certain type of shell that was fired at, at, out of the shotgun. This all feels very familiar to him. The coroner's pretty sure that it was two people that shot. But we know Hackman was the only one that actually fired a weapon at that house. So on the drive back, the duo pull alongside of a bus and they see Caitlin's tour ad on it. Tubbs mentions like, hey, so her show's sold out here in Miami. That's pretty good, right? And Sonny is like, hey, that's, you know, great. You know, we never see each other, right? Like, she's just always on the road and I'm always working. Like, this marriage. He's at, yeah, he's like, <sighs> the, the one time she's in town and I have to work. Like, maybe we'll finally get to hang out in retirement. Oh, God, Sonny. Yeah. Oh, yeah, God. I mean, ba basic, basically, he's he's got to buy a ticket just to see her. Uh, Don't have the heart uh, to you tell know. him it's not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at least he finds time later because it would be it would be even more tragic if the last thing he ever said to her was the conversation where he basically blows her off like a, like a d bag. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now we go to one of the cronies' houses, one of Hackman's cronies. His name is Blatt, Johnny Blatt. He's complaining to his girlfriend, Julia. These people are going to be important, really important later. She is, anyway. <laughs> yeah. He's complaining that they were knocking over houses and everything was going just fine, but Hackman's been going too far. And you're thinking, like, okay, maybe Johnny's going to have a change of heart, and, like, this is going to be how they find out about Hackman, is that he's willing to go to the police because Hackman's going too far. But when you see Johnny, who he really is, that doesn't matter to him. He may be complaining at the time, but then he goes and beats up Julia and spits beer in her face and... He just goes off the handle real fast. He switches gears real fast. Yeah, he goes from being like mad about something else and then happy to like drinks that beer and spits it in her face and just beats the crap out of her. He's not a really nice guy. <laughs> that no, way. no. He's a <laughs> and that's what I'm saying. It's at the very beginning. You start to feel like, okay, Hackman's going too far. His cronies going to flip on him. 
And then you realize, like, no, he's with the worst of the worst. Yeah, they're scumbags. I feel bad for Julie in this episode the most. This isn't the only butt whooping she's going to get, and they're not all warm beer related. No, she, no, she takes a beating. And the vice team kind of leaves her out there, like, are you willing to this? Yeah, they yeah. to get us the information. What What's ridiculous to me is that they not only kind of, do they kind of hang her out to dry, but then no one kind of sits on her later in the episode to, like, Keep an eye out in case Johnny comes back, which turns out it happened. Yeah, like you're saying, like, she's one of the people to feel the most empathy for in this episode. At the precinct, the whole team is there re- reviewing the case of the family. And this is where they get into more detail about the stuff that was stolen. Dad says, this is a case for homicide. We need to hand this over. This has nothing to do with Vice. But I don't understand. Like, if they were going to hand it over, why was he telling them to go look at stuff then? I'm totally confused. Like, <laughs> to help them? because like, of the stolen th- goods. Okay, like, yeah. so they were supposed to help and then send over their information that they found? Because mm-hmm. I was really confused. I was like, okay, so why are you telling them to go investigate if it's not your case? <laughs> yeah, because I think this is why. Because they asked for Vice's help. And okay. so they were going to give them the information that they had. And then Dad's like, and then we're out. Like, we're yeah, not gonna... but they weren't out. Sunny, yeah, though, and Dad doesn't really stand very firm on this being homicide problem. When Sunny interjects, I mean, first it mentioned er- earlier. This is when we find out that in 20 years, Sunny's only seen this type of murder once, and it was Hackman. But then when the conversation continues after the fact, and Sunny tries to get Dad to let him on the case, he even tries to say like, "We don't need any personal vendettas." And Sonny's argument is literally, but I have a personal vendetta. I helped <laughs> yeah. him get out. And Dad's like, well, in that case, you can have two days. <laughs> but it's really foreshadowing what is going to happen. The sad part is if Sonny had just dropped it like, and let Homicide investigate it and not gone on this like, personal vendetta, then what happened in the episode wouldn't have happened. Exactly. Very he, true. And Dad has been fighting this no personal vendettas for like a month now. Yeah, but he's not. <laughs> I mean, come on. Meet the pot in the kettle black here. He, he goes on his own personal vendettas all uh, the time. Not on Vice's payroll. But but it's, he's still a cop, right? He still goes yeah. off. He like takes off. Like, you know, I'm not a cop today. I'm put on my Speedo and I'm not going <laughs> to be a policeman. But I'm still going to go do these things. Like I had a, I had an oath of this man I knew 20 years ago. <laughs> Who I didn't recognize when he came in <laughs> and my house and ended up not being that guy. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we still don't know what that guy's actual identity was. There's a love story there because I don't think I've ever seen love interest for Castillo. I'm starting to wonder. Is he? Well, there is one in the future. Hit. I'm just putting it out there. There's one in the future. This is the first time we see dad where he's he knows he can't stop Sonny. Only thing that he can do is try and contain him. He's really trying to contain him by just he's like pacifying him like, sure, go ahead. Okay, fine. He talks, Sonny talks him into letting him do two days of investigation. That's it. That's all you have is two days. So now we go to Hackman's hideout, and Hackman is there with his wife, and she's telling him, You've gone too far. Like, you murdered an entire family. It's all over the news, on the radio, on the TV. It's everywhere. The newspapers. We should just leave. And Hackman says, No, I got one more big hit that I'm going to make, and then we can go and. And she says, But what about Crockett? Yes. Yeah. He's going to investigate this. He's going to know it's you. And he's like, nah, he'll never know. And he this doesn't is even re- do these cases. That, that's what's ridiculous. He goes, but yeah, he doesn't even work robbery. Well, while you were in prison, you, you kind of <laughs> missed that Vice kind of works robbery and homicide very often. I mean, he's not supposed we, in to fact, work we've it, seen but... a lot. <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> Turns out, you know, sometimes there's not a lot of Vice going on. And so they, they moonlight doing robbery and homicide's job. So this wouldn't be a true Vice story if we didn't include one character. And of course, so I think Tubbs are going to go talk to Izzy. Izzy is going to know what the of real course. deal is. Of course, they only have days to investigate. And so they have to solve it quick. So who do you talk to? <laughs> Who's going to solve the case for you in two ta- in two days? Izzy. Izzy. I love how legitimate he looks with his little, like, the... Uh, what do jeweler, they call that jeweler eye thing? Glass. <laughs> in his suit. His suit. He looks so nice. His hair's all styled and everything. He looks like he's turned the corner and he's like a regular citizen. I know he's not, but because he's buying stolen goods. But, but still, I mean, he looks like he's got it all together. Izzy says that there has been one person who's been coming in. His name is Blatt. And he's been selling stolen goods. He's going to come with like hot goods. He always comes in. He's got the best stuff. But. He knows that it's coming in from home invasions. 
He will let the vice team know next time he sees Black. Back at the precinct, Caitlin calls. She's about to tell Sonny again that she's pregnant. But Tubbs comes over and says that Izzy calls says that Blatt that just left, so they have to run out the door and go see what's up with Blatt. Caitlin decides not to tell Sonny, and Sonny leaves with Tubbs. And so this was another opportunity that she missed to be able to talk to him about it. And this was obviously none of this is her fault. No. And this is just like it's the circumstance that is just playing around her. Yeah. And this is a conversation that I was hinting at earlier is that this is where he just rubbed the wrong way because it felt like he was totally blowing her off. Like she's like, I want to whisper something to you. And he's half listening on the phone. He's talking to Tubbs and he's like not paying attention to her at all. And I'm like, man, way to blow her off. She should have whispered, I want a divorce. (laughs) That would have got his attention. (laughs) <laughs> so now we have this really brief driving scene that's actually really important because Tubbs asks Sonny, hey, is there something bothering you? And Sonny says, before Frankel died, my original partner. You know, the one <laughs> one of my originals. <laughs> Port number, partner number four or five. We're not sure at this point. <laughs> Frankel had run into someone he had been investigating for rape. That person had gotten off of a conviction a few times. And when he saw him, he was like, I feel like I should go over there and I should beat him. Like basically beat him to death because that's what that guy deserves. And Sonny says, I never want to be that kind of cop where I'm driven like that. Where like, I want to take the law into my own hands. I may hold a grudge, but I will arrest them. The process of the law will take care of it. I'm not judge, jury, and executioner. And when he saw that through Frankel, which happened just a couple of days before he got killed, he didn't want to, He decided he didn't want to become one of those cops. And now he's concerned yeah, he that the Hackman that. case is going to turn him into one of those cops. So now we're back at Blatt's hideout. The duo knock on the door and they see Julia. And she's beat up really bad and ask, did Johnny do this? And she says, yes. And she takes that opportunity to invite the police into our house and then the very next thing we see is that the duo are posted up outside of hackman's hideout so they were able to get all of the information they needed out of julia turns out when you beat a woman up she might be a little mad at you and she might tell the police everything you do mm-hmm. she might give up your hideout so and well, the- it's really bad timing for the bad guys in this because they're staked out they execute the bust just as Blatt showing up with three things of pizza. He's just showing up with lunch. <laughs> so they totally ru- ruined lunch. <laughs> They're not exactly doing a great job of hiding either. Like Blatt walks up and he immediately sees them, walks inside and says, hey, <laughs> there's out there. heat outside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was no um, like uh, surveillance going on in this episode. Every time they were there, it's like, well, there's a white car parked right across the street from where we're hiding out. You know, like, okay, that was, what kind of hiding are you guys doing? Can't you get the bug van or something? <laughs> Immediately when they go, uh, the vice team, you know, kick in the door and, and a gun battle starts. At first, I didn't know if that was Hackman's wife or if that was Blatt's girlfriend or whoever. But man, she gets mowed down quick. I have a serious question in what's happening in this scene because they come barging in with no backup. And I think... And that's what Sonny is talks about later, why he wants to transfer in that scene beforehand, because he knew that Hackman was there. So they just came in guns blazing yeah. to bring down Hackman. No backup, no extra surveillance, no, like, they could have sat and waited and called in backup and did a regular bust on that place. But instead, Tubbs and Crockett busted on their own. Sonny just starts, I mean, he's just spraying bullets everywhere. He hits Hackman's wife. He hits someone else. Hackman gets away. Well, you think he hits Hackman. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Hackman and most of his cronies get away. So now Sonny is left with this thought that he's shot an innocent person, quote unquote innocent. She's still associated with Hackman. Yeah, I'm going to say like, she's not innocent. So let's get that straight. (laughs) You're married to a man that goes around murdering people. Uh, Someone of the police bust in. You might get shot and you might actually get what you're supposed to get because you shouldn't be married to a criminal. (laughs) Also, didn't she kill (laughs) her husband in the forgive us our debts wasn't she the one that no, actually? No, no. oh yeah she did she killed gus yes mm-hmm. yeah he wasn't her husband he was he was a wicked, yeah the, like the loose oh, end yes that's right that's right yeah so she's a murderer like no i have no sympathy for her they, they shouldn't have gone out with backup without backup because he could get tubs killed how about that no, <laughs> <laughs> so now Sonny is really torn because if he, he thinks that he was going to go in there and shoot and kill hackman but instead two other people got killed and hackman got away so now they're at the hospital Hackman's wife got shot in the neck. 
<laughs> I was like, how did you shoot her in the neck? She got shot in the back, clearly. <laughs> Tubbs is comforting Sonny, saying that the it's wife got shot fault. on accident. It's not your fault that you came in there just trying to unload every clip that you had. Sonny says that he wanted Hackman more than anything. He was basically, at that moment, willing to do anything and everything to bring down Hackman. That was his his opportunity, which made him do something really dumb. We get another conversation between Sonny and his wife where he pretty much just blows her off again. He's telling her, like, oh, I can't pick you up from the airport. She's like, that's fine. You know, uh, I'll see you at the show. And he's like, oh, I'm busy. He's like, well, I'll see you next week. He's like, I'm busy. I'll see you next year. <laughs> Maybe me. next year, but I'm, I'm busy. She says, like, oh, it's okay. I'll see you at the church. Like, no, I can't come to the show. I may not be able to come to the show because I shot a woman. And she's like, oh, my God. <laughs> she doesn't know her husband at all. No. <laughs> How so, many women have you shot? Sonny? All that. <laughs> Does she know about the kitty shot, too? <laughs> so all of this dodging and blowing off his wife has made him tired. So he takes a nap. Tubbs, you know, he looks so sweet sleeping. Didn't want to wake him up to tell him that the woman he shot died. Yeah, and it's actually a great scene, too, Like as far as filming goes tubs comes over wakes up sunny he says hey we should go she's died about 10 minutes ago she died sunny goes over to the door there's like a gold colored light coming out of the room that's mm -hmm. washing over him as he's despondent looking in the room thinking that he's killed this woman and also someone who is his sworn enemy that may want revenge against him now for doing this immensely complicates the hackman case for him now and it puts so much on Sonny that we we immediately go from there to the next scene. He's he literally goes in Dad's office and says he wants he wants to transfer out of Vice, you know. And that caught me off. Like, whoa, like oh, he want he wants to quit now. But he still wants to you be. Know? A, sorry, He's not even. But he still wants to be a cop though. He just wants to be a cop and mess up somebody else's <laughs> decision. <laughs> <laughs> I want to do my. I want to be in a different department where you don't. Well, I can mess up that one and be. <laughs> <laughs> Dad says, hey, cool, Like, but the transfer's going to take a while. So think about, he said, think about it, are you sure? You're like, yeah. And also, you're still working this case. So until the transfer goes, so you're still working this. By the way, here's a report. It was Hackman's gun that hit the wife, not yours. So you didn't actually kill her. But that's not going to make things better for Sonny because it wasn't that he killed the wife. That wasn't the problem. The problem was that he was willing to do anything to bring down Hackman including act crazy. irrational he's like, acting yeah. irrational back at blatt's johnny is beating his girlfriend up again for talking to the cops everything and, is falling apart for, for the hackman gang and julia again is taking poor the thing. Brunt she's taking a the... beating how come they didn't like help her out or like hide her or something after she they knew she they they had to know that blatt was going to figure out that she was the one that told but they don't give her any protection it's not like well hey you know what you you helped us do this basically and now we're going to like set you up so you get the crap beat out of you <laughs> worse than before. Yeah. And now exactly, that was my thought. And, and I mean, I went one step further is thinking like, well, if Hackman and Black got away, then how come Stan's not out in the surveillance van sitting on the girlfriend's house? Why is no one around for him to just come by and just beat the crap out of her again? I know later in the series, she's going to find her way back to her feet. <laughs> she's going to be a waitress. <laughs> <laughs> so she'll have <laughs> but yeah she is key witness number one she's the person that got the information from on where the bus was going to happen like she should be in witness protection yes at least and, if, and john's right like if they were supposed to be being good detectives it only stands to reason that he's going to go back there after he got away so why are they not like waiting for him there to pick him up because he's a criminal. <laughs> yeah, because the now they've hit a snag in the investigation. Of course, what do you do? You have they they're down to one day left to, to investigate. What do you do? You go see Izzy. <laughs> <laughs> they show Izzy a picture and he says, "Yeah, I recognize that man. He's real dumb, and he likes to talk a lot. And so I wasn't listening." <laughs> and he he said something about a big hit, but I wasn't listening to anything that he had to say because he's a big dumb idiot. <laughs> I love that Izzy goes on and on about how stupid he is. He's like he's so stupid. He talks about his business in front of everybody, and he's always talking about everything. He tells you all the details, that, and he's so dumb because he's a criminal. And then they're like, okay, so what did he say? He's like, I don't know, something about tonight. <laughs> like, you don't know where? No, I don't know where. I don't know when. I don't know what. I just know it's tonight. I wasn't really listening. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're to Caitlin's performance in Miami too. So we go to Club One Two Three Five, which, by the way, is a real club in Miami. No matter how dumb you think that club <laughs> name is, name. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
which was also um, owned by so, Prince at one point in time. Hmm. Oh, no Your way. Presence. See, it, it felt like it felt almost like a real performance, like video from a real like Sheena Easton concert, you know. Um, by the way, turns out Sonny did have time to see his wife. <laughs> he worked it in there. You know, when you shoot a woman, they don't want you at work the next day. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, you know what? Take the day off. You shot somebody on accident. Just don't come in tomorrow. It's all right. <laughs> Transfer in any way. Yeah, exactly. It's right before she's going to go on. So they, they only have a couple minutes. Over at Blatt's, Tubbs is talking to the girlfriend. She's beat up really bad. He is acting like he feels sorry for yeah. her about it. How guilty does Tubbs feel? You know, uh, sorry, you, you got you got your ass beat on account of us. Yeah, but she knows what the score is, what the hit is that night. So now Tubbs is racing to the venue to tell Sonny that the hit that Hackman's going to do is at Club One Two Three Five. He's but he can't get a hold of Sonny because Sonny's inside. He's not next to his car, so he can't answer his car phone. And Sonny's just having the time of his life. He is so happy backstage, no, so sad, watching <laughs> Caitlyn perform in front of her fans. Okay, but I have a question. I have a wrench here. I don't understand if if Tup knows what's going to happen and he's just racing over there. Can't he have called like the cops and have them go over there too? Like, hey, you know what? I might not get there. Can't you call or call a, security at call the club? Call security. <laughs> call dad and have dad yeah. go over there. Call somebody. <laughs> Besides, like he just tried to call. Yes. He tried to hard crock it once. No, nope, he's not there. Damn. <laughs> I mean, he could See, be saving you, his friend's You're thinking life, like right? a detective. <laughs> you're thinking like a detective. I was distracted because the whole time I was thinking, like, is she wearing a wedding dress? Is, is that what she's wearing? <laughs> also, he's not really in that big of a hurry to get there. He's obeying like the traffic laws. He's stopping at red lights and stuff. I'm just saying. I have a suspicion. Maybe Tubbs we do, to understand. care about her. <laughs> we're starting to understand why there are very few Tubbs chase scenes. <laughs> Hackman sneaks in as an electrical repairman goes up to where the like the projector lighting like is. The spotlight. The too. spotlight's up on top. Shoots and kills that person and pulls out a sniper rifle. He sees so, Caitlin performing on stage and he sees Sonny backstage. Smiling like he's <laughs> grinning from <laughs> ear to ear. So so he kills the guy working the spotlight and he's setting up the gun. Does he work the spotlight? Because the performance is still going. <laughs> shoot her till the end of the performance <laughs> and she's moving around the stage and the spotlight is following her so is he up there moving the spotlight around before he kills her i don't know but we were talking about why is he so slow like you just shot somebody that that gun made a noise you're not worried about like someone busting in there and being like what's going on in here he's like the slowest assassin ever puts his gun together really methodically like, I don't have to hurry. Here's the biggest question I have in this scene. Did Hackman know that Sonny and Caitlin were a thing? And he changed, he was going to kill Sonny. And then he changed to kill Caitlin. Or was he always going to kill Caitlin because he knew they were a thing? Or was he going to kill Caitlin and he just happened to see, like, surprise, like, oh, oh, Sonny's here too. Which is it in this case? At this moment, at this exact moment, does he know that Caitlin and Sonny are, are a thing? I think he does know that Caitlin and Sonny are a thing because I think that the ultimate for, ha for Hackman, the ultimate revenge would be that he's going to kill her. He's going to kill Caitlin and then Sonny can't do anything about it. Right. I mean, if he kills him, that's great. I mean, he's dead. Yes. Yeah. And he, but he can't live with the guilt of like uh, my actions caused my wife to die. And then I can, I couldn't catch the guy and, and put him away and my actions See, left him I out of prison. <laughs> so all of it is his fault basically. Yeah, and see, and at, at the end, he makes a comment that makes me think that he kind of blamed, even though it was his gun that technically killed his wife, Hackman's gun that killed his wife, he blames Sonny for her dying from him kicking the door in. So I think this was like revenge for killing his wife. Like he, he blamed Sonny, even though it was his gun that killed her. Well, how would he know that it was his, his, you know what I mean? He wouldn't know that it was his own gun because he didn't have the yeah. medical examiner's report. So, But this was the big hit that they were going to do before leaving town. Before 
Hackman's wife got killed. So, mm-hmm. oh, that's true. He had a big job he was going to do. They had one last big job. This was never going to be a robbery. They didn't rob anything. This was strictly true. to kill so, Kalen. True. That is true. So, who knows? Maybe, maybe you're it, right. Maybe you they know, changed it last minute. Like I remember when we. When we first met Caitlin, too, remember, she was uh, involved with those dirty record execs and stuff. So, like, there was a little criminal element mixed in. Like, is this from, like, the label? Did the label put a hit on her? Yeah, we don't know. We're assuming that it's because, like, maybe he changed his big hit to, to strike back at Sonny. But maybe Hackman's all thing all along, regardless of his wife, was to kill Caitlin. That he was going to also exact hurt on Sonny. I still think that it, it wasn't. I still think he had a job that was going to be something that was going to have a lot of money. Because he kept talking about money. He said, like, we're going to get a big score. So who's going to pay him to kill Sonny? Nobody. There's a whole bunch of layers to this. So uh, for you out there, I'd like to hear what your theories are on what if this was the original big hit that Hackman was going to do. Or did they change it? And was his first person who was going to kill, was that going to be Sonny? And did he change it later when he realized that Caitlyn and Sonny were an item? Because this ex- this feels an awful lot like it wasn't planned all the way through, that this was just a hit. But was this hit planned from yeah. the beginning? Yeah, I don't know. The only thing I know for sure is that Sonny Crockett is no Kevin Costner. <laughs> This scene is set up really well, too. Caitlin's performing on stage. She's having like a really good performance. Her fans are loving it. Sonny is backstage, happy for his wife to see her again, to see her in front of her fans. He is the happiest we have ever seen him. And she comes walking off stage, smiling at her husband, fans screaming in the background. And that bullet hits her in the back, and she goes down. And Sonny is the only one that knows what's happening. Yeah, because it's too. It was so loud in there from the fans screaming. They don't know. The, no one knows except him. And she's and it's like it's, it's almost like she instantly dies. And right when Sonny is now, at his happiest, it's all taken away from him. Yeah, and she never told him. Uh, the, <laughs> she never told him she was pregnant. Oh, she never got to tell him. The only problem I had with this scene because you're right. It's like it, it, it's like the perfect setup. She's walking away. She's about to give Sonny like a big hug. She's happy to see him. He's happy to see her. He's so happy. Come on, Vice. Why are you being lazy now? There's no blood splatter. There's nothing. Like, she falls <laughs> down, clearly not shot. And, and then, like, scene's over. You know, it's like, like, come on, guys. Come on. I know you have a special effects department. <laughs> so now we go to Crockett's boat. He's back on the boat. He's not staying at the house. He's there drinking. He has all drunk. of Caitlin's. Yeah, he has all of Caitlin's stuff out in it and the cross that Hackman gave him when he got out of prison. And Sonny found out that Hackman was actually guilty and he helped a guilty man get off of death row. Tubbs shows up and he thought that Sonny might just need some help. Phone rings. Tubbs answers. He's shocked while he's talking on the phone. He hangs up the phone. Still shocked. Slowly turns to Sonny and says, Caitlin was seven weeks pregnant too. And Sonny flips out, kicks everything off the table and runs off. And we fade to black. When we come back, it's a flashback of the slow-mo of seeing Caitlin get shot again. And then Sonny working on his boat. He's been there three weeks. He hasn't left, hasn't talked to anyone. Tubbs has been by, comes by again, just to check in and see how his friend's doing. And Sonny is like, don't talk to me. I'm not here to talk to anyone. I don't need any help from anyone. Everyone just please leave. Is it callous of me to think that there might be a theory out there in which Sonny was in on it to get her money? (laughs) <laughs> i mean clearly they never saw each other during the marriage <laughs> we go to the precinct the vice team are there meeting without sunny and zito so it's a very small team without those two just saying don't talk about zito <laughs> <laughs> Tubbs pulls out a file black called his girlfriend from chicago so this is really suspicious they're gonna have to track black to see what he's up to and maybe he knows where hackman is and stan says well maybe we can finally drive a stake through hackman's heart then we'll look over the shoulder and suddenly standing in the doorway like, creepily Sonny <laughs> 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 says so, he got bored and he is, just wanted to come back to work because it was too boring on the boat this is an interesting scene because Sonny walks in and you know they're all about trying to catch hackman don't you know Throwing him a surprise party and stuff like that. <laughs> and the main thing I, 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 I took from it, though, is that Sonny's back, but you know he's still not over Caitlyn's death. You could almost see it in, in his eyes. Oh, he's about to go rampage Crockett. But the most important thing is that him walking in on the meeting means now he knows where Hackman is. Yeah, because the team talks about that they've been tracking Hackman all over the islands in the Keys. 
like area and they're always like a couple days behind so they know he's moving around a bunch but they're not 100% certain where he is at the moment. They're always a couple of days behind. And they know he's using the name Crockett as a slap to you. <laughs> right in the face. <laughs> so he's somewhere in the creek using the name Crockett so he can hide from ex- extradition. Hmm. I wonder what Crockett's going to do. That's exactly what dad's thinking. Because now they're going to go stake out Blatt's house. And they're going to see when he comes in. That way they can t- talk to him and find out where Hackman's at. And Sonny sounds like. He's the one that's going to go talk to Blatt, and Dad is real torn. You see him thinking really hard. He doesn't ever say anything. He lets Sonny go do the investigation, but you can see he's just torn apart between personal... Oh, he did He did say something. Professional. He, he gave him back transfer papers, which I felt kind of should have ended with a hug, but, you know, Dad <laughs> did his normal stare. <laughs> I do think it's kind of funny that he gave him back his transfer papers. I say that because Sonny takes them and as if he's not going to transfer now, even though he's starting to become what we were foreshadowing earlier with his ex partner. He's really thankful to Castillo for not filing those papers. But yeah, now everyone should be afraid of where Croc is going. He's going into a bad place. We go over to Blatt's to do our post it up outside, like literally right across the street. <laughs> literally not hiding. <laughs> and Melissa, you were saying now they're worried about Julie. Yeah. Oh, now we got to go say it. <laughs> now when you can get something out of it. <laughs> yeah, I'll because tell they you go, this, better... The better be cold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They, because they say, they go, we have to get in there fast because who knows what it'll do to her. Yeah, because he, he broke her ribs and her face last time you guys like tried to intervene so yeah you might want to get there fast <laughs> she opens the doors johnny he says that he missed her now grab some beers and go upstairs he's such the romantic yeah uh nothing nothing good should happen to this guy no exactly <laughs> i hope those beers were cold he turns around and sees tubs in the door with a gun drawn sunny is then on the other side with his gun drawn too and we zoom in on sunny's face like sunny's like i'm about to murder everyone Everyone's yeah. everyone that's ever been associated with Hackman's gonna die. He's definitely on edge. <laughs> At the precinct, Dad, Switek, and Sonny are talking. Black gave up Hackman in less than ten minutes of quote unquote interrogation. And Melissa, you and I were talking, and I was saying that sounds like they used some pretty harsh interrogation techniques because he gave them up pretty quickly. But you were saying How are they not sure it's not a trap that he came back? Why did he come back? He came back, it was really easy. He gave up the location super easy. Because, like, maybe because Hackman knew, like, Sonny would get there and he couldn't take him back. There's no way to extradite him because they don't have any, they don't have that protocol with those, with those islands. So maybe he was, like, all set up so he could see that Sonny could see, like, look at, I'm living under your name on this island. I bought this house. I'm, I'm going to get away with everything and you'll never shoot me. So I'll just live here forever because you can't take me. Oh, yeah. He's got a beautiful, got a beautiful house in the Caribbean. He's single now. (laughs) You know, he's got money. (laughs) <laughs> yeah so i don't know if it was what it was but 10 minutes seems like a, a short amount of time to give up somebody when you're supposed to be like a hardened criminal <laughs> so i was saying like they waterboarded his ass until well they he... should have but i mean i hope they did that but... uh-huh. <laughs> so 10 minutes later crockett's on the island <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well what black gives up he gives up the exact island that hackman is on sunny's like okay i'm going home and dad you can see dad he is just being ripped apart and he turns to sunny and you think that dad's gonna say like don't do anything crazy we have this cornered if he leaves the island we'll arrest him we can't get him extradited but if he leaves the island we we will arrest him please do not go and try and take the law into your own hands you can see that that's what's on dad's face but dad says get some rest sunny because he's trying to say like get some rest go home and think about what you're doing <laughs> Think about you being a cop and what this means for you as a person, (laughs) not just like your career. Like, what is this going to mean for you in the future as a person? So now we're going to go to Hackman's. He's on his island. He's got a beautiful house right on the water. He's out sunning, looking at a book. He's going to retire in the highlight. Crockett comes walking up and Hackman smiles at him. He says, well, I guess we're even now. Sonny says, not even close. Hackman asks Sonny if he likes the house. Took a long time to get it set up. Like, hey, you appreciate it. He's very confident here. What he's confident in is that Sonny is a police officer. He's not going to come and kill Hackman, and he can't arrest him. So Hackman's going to taunt him while he's on his island. And he's thinking that Sonny's going to come and, like, you know, just to tell him off or something like that. But you can see in Sonny's face 
That is not why he's there. Yeah. And Hackman slowly realizes, oh shit. He's very confident for someone that Sonny's about to shoot in the face. This is where Hackman kind of, we talked about earlier, why did he do his like signature thing to kill the whole family? And almost like he was trying to get Crockett's attention. And we fast forward and we get that same kind of confidence and where he's just kind of rubbing it in Sonny's face. You see like the whole time he's like just rubbing it in. Like, I know you're not going to do nothing with that gun. You're not going to shoot me. And the whole time, his face never changes. He is dead on holding that gun, staring him down. At a certain point, you think Hackman might might start to lose some of that confidence. He stays that confident all the way until, well, Sonny shoots him. I think Hackman realizes that he's, you know, that his only respite here is that he could continue to point out that Sonny's a police officer. Like, a police officer wouldn't shoot a man in glasses. <laughs> but he, like, that's the only uh-huh. thing that he can do here is try and remind Sonny that he's a police officer over and over again because he says, you got me off a of death row. Yeah. I know you wouldn't, you would never kill anyone out of cold blood like that. And then Sonny he says, think you, again. <laughs> and fires. You'd never shoot an unarmed man. I want to point out, he says, you'd never shoot an unarmed man. And then he said, Sonny, oh yeah? And Sonny shoots him. And then as Sonny's walking away, I think it was very smart of Sonny to put the gun in his hand for an alibi. <laughs> yes, that is a point of debate. That's another thing we can talk about. Like, there's Caitlin and Sonny. Did Hackman know that they were a thing? There's also, we didn't see the gun when Sonny was talking to Hackman, but we see the gun in Hackman's hand as Sonny's walking away. First of all, we can all agree, Sonny has killed Hackman in cold blood. You can leave revenge aside, like it's still murder. He murdered Hackman. You can justify it with things like revenge and stuff like that, but he murdered him. The question now is, Mm -hmm. did Hackman have the gun behind the book or did Sonny plant the gun? He had the gun behind the book. There's no, they, they, there's no way. No, I don't, if he planted the gun, they would have showed that. Like, but they've oh, shown oh. Sonny has gone off the deep end. Yes, Maybe. but that's what I'm saying. So then that would be the that's like the nail in the coffin that he's gone off the deep end. If they wanted that in the story, they would have put that in the story. But like, that would have been there that he planted the Hackman, gun. And you- <laughs> Hackman's argument to Sonny specifically notes that he would not shoot an unarmed man. Yes, but why does he hold the book up to his claiming chest? To be- the whole entire time he's talking to Sonny, he's got the book up on his chest and you can't see his you can only why see one he, hand so why would you do yes, that but Sonny, hold on Sonny snuck up on him okay and so he's reading the book he looks up and sees Sonny. okay why would he be reading the book with a gun in his hand the whole because time? he probably knows Sonny's going to be there because it was probably all a setup so that he could get like we talked about <laughs> Sonny has already crossed the line he has already become his partner frankel Crossing the line of beyond being a police officer, I am not putting it past him for sticking a gun in his hand before he. I don't think off you. I don't think you understand what I'm saying, boat. though. What I'm saying is that yeah, okay, so that he's off the edge and he could have done that. But if they wanted you to know that, they the writers would have showed you that. It's my advice. They are so transparent with their stuff. <laughs> No, it's not. I'm not. Well, it's it's also, not a cut. It's also it, like you guys have these wild theories on stuff. And <laughs> I think you're also, reading too much advice, into it. We didn't even, they didn't even show a blood splatter when they killed his wife. We've seen many other mistakes throughout the series. So maybe they cut out the scene where he puts the gun in his hand. I'm sticking with Sonny put the gun in his hand. <laughs> Luckily, we have one more week where we can continue to debate this. And then next season, because Sonny's going to continue to go off the deep end here. So yeah. <laughs> oh yeah yeah oh, i'm not so, debating that he went off the deep end i'm saying he went off the deep end and he shot him and he shouldn't have you know that was in cold blood because he didn't see a gun and nothing was pointed at him but what i'm saying is there was not enough time for him to plant the gun and walk away because they showed him the entire time <laughs> we are basing this on the fact we've already talked about timelines where it's been two years and somehow he has recovered in the past week from a gunshot wound <laughs> to the chest his wife who was on, who has been on tour for the for the entire season somehow is pregnant with his baby. We've talked about these timelines before. Not everything's going to line up. So maybe <laughs> maybe time jump. Who knows how how long he stood there and stared at him after he shot him. I'm not going to say anything else. <laughs> <laughs> 
the debate will continue next there's week. no debate i've seen the show <laughs> i know what happens but in we the don't end. know we don't know so <laughs> we can continue to debate our side with from not knowing hey i think this is where okay, this is gonna but go you have to debate with facts not like <laughs> stuff you made up in your head that you think happened <laughs> That, that's all fake news. That's all fake news. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> well, this is the end of the episode, too, because then we get it to be continued. And I'm going to talk more about that in my final thoughts on what I think that to be continued means from someone who's never seen the show. So we're going to save that. <laughs> We've had a healthy debate <laughs> about the gun placement. <laughs> Let's save the to be continued debate for our final thoughts. Let's first go talk about this week's music. Because now Sheena Easton's back, so we gotta close out Sheena Easton. Like we gotta go away. Bye. <laughs> we gotta get rid of Sheena Easton. <laughs> Let's go talk about this week's music. All right, John. We have some familiar faces in music this week. Something about some episode. For, forget, forgave, for, for, I can't remember what it is. We got for us this week in music. All right. So yeah, we're gonna start out. I like you said, closing Sheena Easton out. So um, I have Literally. already. <laughs> Bye, I've Felicia. already talked about she. Yes, yeah. I have already <laughs> talked about Sheena Easton in guest stars and in music multiple times. So we are gonna wrap this up by just I'm just gonna list off a few things I thought I might have left out. So let's start out. Her songs Don't Turn Your Back and Follow My Rainbow were in the episode. In 2017, join the cast of Lus London's West End Theater Show, Second Street. And so she's been doing uh, some like Broadway acting stuff. She also starred opposite Stacey Keach in the John Carpenter directed Showtime trilogy, Body Bags. Also, Guest starred in the cult syndicated series The Highlander, which makes a ton of sense now that I know that she's <laughs> Scottish. She's been doing a lot of Broadway type shows, but the one thing that jumped out at me about Shayna Easton's career, and I know she's a mom, done a lot of voices in cartoons. I had already talked about she was in All Dogs Go to Heaven 2 and in All Dogs Chris Carroll, but I do connect something that has been a theme in my guest stars in music this season. She also provided voice for What's New Scooby Doo. And Scooby Doo, the Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> Scooby Doo getting a lot of play here, podcast in <laughs> season four. In fact, I, I want to say she must have been in one of these with some of our previous guest stars. But I, <laughs> she also did voice for in the Wild Thornberries. She did a voice for Duckman. She was also did a voice for Road Rovers and Gargoyles, which has also really? popped up in a number number of my music and guest stars. Yeah, she's the bad girl, like the, the villain in Gargoyles. Yeah, yeah, like Banshee or something. Mm -hmm. Hey, you want to challenge Melissa to something? It's not 80s pop history. It's not current who's married to who. It's early 90s cartoons. Yes. Batman, the animated <laughs> series, Justice League, yeah. Gargoyles, the Gummy Bears. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know my stuff. <laughs> All right. That's going to bring us to another familiar face. The song Do What We're Told, which sounds very familiar. <laughs> we have Peter Gabriel. This is Gabriel's sixth appearance in our Vice music, and we still have one to go. So I'm going to have to find even more stuff to talk about, Peter Gabriel. <laughs> to talk about what to talk about. Well, turns out Peter Gabriel still relevant. I don't know how. I don't know why. <laughs> but his song, In Your Eyes, gets some serious love in Deadpool 2. Really? Uh, I don't know how it worked out. But yes, like there is a, not only is the song in the movie, but there is a scene in which like they, they worked it into the scene. This exact song, We Do What We're Told, pops up. In the final season, this this just recent season of The Americans, which was the last season, wow. it was in the opening episode, Dead Hand, and it's his fourth song in the series. So there's still some Peter Gabriel fans out there in Hollywood. <laughs> so good on you, Peter. Hey, John, I'm going to give you full credit for getting through a Peter Gabriel moment without mentioning Phil Collins. But I'm going to mention Phil Collins <laughs> just to put it in here. Damn it. <laughs> go, go away. Okay, so let's talk about our only actual new artist to our music. And probably the biggest artist in our music. Sorry, Pete. <laughs> we get the song Lazy Bones by Hoagie Carmichael. 
whose actual name is Hoagland Howard Carmichael. So yes, oh it's not a nickname. His oh name is God. Hoagland. <laughs> now, to give to give him some credit, he was born in 1899. So he, he also lived until 1981, which is impressive. He was named after a circus troupe, the Hoaglands, who <laughs> actually were staying at his parents' house when his mom was pregnant. <laughs> So, Hoagland was an American composer, <laughs> pianist, singer, actor, and band leader. He's actually one of the most successful Tin Pan Alley songwriters. If you are not familiar with the Tin Pan Alley movement, that was from the late 1800s until the uh, mid or to the 1930s. And it was focused on songwriters coming out of a specific area of New York. He composed several hundred songs, including 50 of them achieved hit status. Some of his most famous include Stardust, Georgia On My Mind, The Nearest of You, and Heart and Soul, which are four of the most recorded songs of all time. To take you back to that time frame, uh, the, the composers would come up with a melody. So he would he comes up with a piano and all that and, and composes the music. And later on, he put together Georgia On My Mind back in the 30s. And then in 1960, Ray Charles put lyrics to it, and the Ray Charles version is probably one of the most famous Ray Charles songs. Even though you may not recognize the song, you would recognize it once if you actually heard it or heard the artist who ended up recording, putting lyrics to it. Actually won an Academy Award for the original song in 1951 with his song In the Cool, Cool, Cool of the Evening. And he also appeared as an actor, musically performed in 14 films. Not only did he act in them, but he actually performed the music in the film. <laughs> he hosted three music variety radio programs during his time. He was also he also did performances on TV and wrote two autobiographies. <laughs> when you live long enough, you can do like a first half and a second half. Yeah, yeah. When you live to be eighty-two, you know, uh, yeah. th there's a lot to cover. Like maybe he missed a few things in the last twenty years, <laughs> and he actually has a lot to talk about. He's got an extremely interesting life. Good old Hoagie. Extremely meager beginnings. I mean, he held jobs in construction. He worked at a bicycle chain factory, even a slaughterhouse <laughs> before becoming famous. Okay. <laughs> and if that wasn't enough, he earned a law degree in 1926 from the uh, University of Indiana. He actually worked in law until 1929. He just did music on the weekend, but he didn't have his heart in the legal trade. He actually got fired from his firm in 1929 and just went to making music full time. And that actually helped him out because when the Great Depression happened, considerable amount of his savings, and what saved him was his music, was his composing. That's what got him through the, the, the Great Depression. And that's actually what ended up leading him to writing songs for films and for other artists. Four dozen songs written expressly for motion picture. And those songs composed were later recorded with lyrics, legendary artists like singers Bing Crosby, Ella Fitzgerald, Frank Sinatra, and I already mentioned Ray Charles. When I was getting my notes together for this episode, when I saw Peter Gabriel and Sheena Easton, like, okay, we already talked about them a bunch, and I saw Hoagie. I'm like, I can't wait to find out about Hoagie. <laughs> <laughs> yep, so his on-screen debut as an actor was in 1937, the movie Hopper started in that with Cary Grant and Constance Bennett and even performed the song, his song, Old Man Moon. By 1942, when the war broke out, he started writing wartime songs and regularly toured with the USO. Around that same time, he also moved into the former mansion of chewing gum heir William P. Wrigley Jr., which <laughs> I was unaware that Wrigley Field and the Chicago Cubs were previously owned by a chewing gum. <laughs> it makes me wonder if we just narrowly escaped some type of Bazooka Joe stadium. <laughs> In 1967, the Guinness Book of World Records listed them of having the longest song title. The song was called I'm a Cranky Old Yank in a Clanky Old Tank on the Streets of Yokohama with my Honolulu mama doing the, those B-O-B-O -B -O, flat on my C-O Hirohito blues. <laughs> that was the name of the song. So he actually said it was a joke and it was actually supposed to end the game with Yank. 
So in 1955, at this point, well into acting and performing on screen, he reprised the role Sam the Piano Man in the short-lived TV adaptation of Cos of Casablanca. Other roles that you that he's famous for playing is he played Jonesy the Ranch Hand in season one of the Western Laramie in 1959. He also provided the voice for a parody of himself called Stony Carmichael in an episode of the Flintstones in 1961. <laughs> in 1971, he was inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame along with Ellington. And pretty much after that, he didn't didn't do a ton. I mean he released a couple autobiographies. He even later in life said that he feels like he wasted some of the end of his life because he could have got a lot more accomplished. But, I mean, accomplished a pretty pretty good amount. So, if you didn't know who Hoagland Howard Carmichael was before, <laughs> now you know the most famous Hoagland. <laughs> <laughs> Hoagie delivered. It was what everything I was hoping it would be. When I saw, like I was saying, when I saw Gabriel and Easton, I'm like, Hoagie man, this is all on you. <laughs> You're getting and, the spotlight. He delivered. Let's go give our final thoughts on this episode and wrap this one up because we, I mean, we're here. It's sunny amnesia time. So let's wrap this <laughs> thing up. All right, Melissa, how about you kick us off? What are your final thoughts as the vice veteran? What are your final thoughts on this episode? I have always liked this episode. I think they did a good job tying up the Sheena Easton storyline and making it so that she's gone. <laughs> no. I actually felt sorry for her. I mean, I mean, I mean, obviously I felt sorry for her. She kept trying to tell him that she was pregnant and he just kept blowing her off. And it's, it's always, it's all stuff that's going to haunt Sonny for a long time that he didn't get a chance to finish out his life with her and all that. So I, I obviously, I love the Sunny Amnesia storyline. So I have been waiting for this episode to come. So I, I, I feel bad that I've been waiting for <laughs> her to go. But it's my favorite storyline of the whole series. So I'll say that right now. So I'm very excited for that. I'm very excited for you guys to see the Amnesia storyline. <laughs> it's a good episode. I thought it was well written. I think it's well done. I think there's obviously going to be some like conspiracy theory stuff that we can go back and forth with. Like what we think this meant and that meant. And we'll never really know like what if what the writers intended. I think it's a good episode. I'm sad for Sonny. Not as sad. Is that bad that I'm not as sad as I was at, for Tubbs when he lost his child and girlfriend? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, he's got a kid and a lady somewhere. <laughs> John, what are your final thoughts? I love this episode. This episode is fantastic. We've been kind of down on some of the episodes this season. We've made a lot of fun at some of the episodes this season. And we've had a few good episodes, but I think for me, th this is now my favorite episode of the season. I thought this was the best one so far. And it's a two-parter. It's not done yet. We're not even done yet. We've got one more episode to go that's going to include part of this storyline. I was blown away. I, I really liked this episode. You know, It only took us to the end of the episode. Yeah, uh, to the end of the season. I think it really came through in a lot of ways. Power with Ian, the foreshadowing, and, and then him losing Sheena and finding out she was pregnant and, and all of that. And I, I know we make fun of some of the timelines and stuff, but I mean, it, it's a really solid episode on its own. Even if you came into the episode not having seen Forgive Us Our Debt and without having seen the next episode of the continuation of this, so... I thought this was a, a extremely strong episode, probably the best one of the season so far. And it is sad. We've got to see some of the stuff with the turmoil between in, in their relationship and then with him blowing her off. Then all of a sudden, you know, going to the concert and how happy he was and knowing that he's going to be a dad. And then all that gets taken away from him. Tubbs, uh, you, you hope this can help him through it because he lost a kid, even though he's not technically, his kid's still alive, but we haven't been <laughs> able to find him yet. Tubbs lost Tubbs Jr., you know, and now Crockett's lost his kid. But we, and we don't know if Crockett will ever have another kid. It's not like he had any kids for this, right? <laughs> Stevie, Billy. <laughs> he has a new dad now. <laughs> why no one called him i thought it was a fantastic episode and i am now super excited for the amnesia storyline i will be honest i was not super excited for the amnesia storyline because <laughs> i have been exposed to soap operas growing up and uh usually amnesia means we have we have nothing else we we've <laughs> run out of ideas and so that 
that's what was kind of scaring me coming up to it. But knowing knowing this is what's going to lead us there, now I'm excited. And maybe the amnesia is a good thing, too. Because, I mean, he did just lose his wife and child. Probably good he's not going to remember that or murdering a man in cold blood. Like, good thing those <laughs> memories will be gone. Well, I'm going to agree with you guys. This is a really good episode. I really enjoyed this episode. This is what Vice does really well. Vice stories are the best when they torture their own people. And I know how bad that sounds, but the best episodes are when Vice tortures their own people. And so this is a really good episode. I really enjoyed this one. I, I agree with you guys on everything. I'm going to put out three reasons why I really enjoyed this episode. One, it's great to see Sonny happy. And he was really, really happy. And things were finally really clicking in his life. Two... We don't have to see Sheena Easton anymore. <laughs> Poor Sheena. <laughs> it's not her fault. <laughs> She's gone. Three, we are seeing the descent, not just of Sonny, but of the whole Vice team. They are collapsing under the weight of being police officers. And the stuff that they have been through and the stuff that they have seen, you can see how much it is wearing on all of them. And this is really foreshadowing into what season five is going to be like. Because all the stuff they've, been, they've done, all the stuff they've been through, Everything that's happened to them, it's going to wear on them over time, especially when like your wife gets murdered right in front of you and your son gets murdered right in front of you. All of these things happen like it's going to wear on them as people. And we are seeing the transformation in them happening already. And I am ready for Unhinged Sunny to go down this path of now all those seeds that I've sown are starting to sprout. And all the things that have happened in his past are going to come back around to haunt him. And there's nothing he can do about it now. And here we are. And maybe Amnesia is going to be good for him. In the end, it's I can almost guarantee my thought is that it's not. I have one last point that I'm going to make on here. And that's this to be continued. There's only two real possibilities on what the to be continued means here. Maybe three. The maybe is maybe... Hackman is still alive because he shot him in like the stomach or the chest or something. So maybe he's still alive. But in reality, there's two stories that could potentially happen here for it to be continued. One, someone is getting revenge for Hackman. The odds of that are extremely low. They have everyone arrested. There's no one that really needs to get revenge for Hackman. No one really liked him to begin with anyway. So what does that mean? The war path of Rage Crockett continues and Dad's decision to let Sonny be like unmonitored and like just hope that Sonny does the best and also kind of okay if he goes off and does this because we understand where he's coming from. It's going to come back around to haunt the entire Vice team. And I think that's where we're going. And that's going to do it for us this week. This is a very dark way to end this episode. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We would love to hear from you. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. You can follow us on Twitter at go with the heat, Instagram at go with the heat, Facebook.com slash go with the heat. You can pretty much find us anywhere and everywhere. Go with the heat. You know how to get a hold of us. Check out that website, go with the heat.com. Where else <laughs> is it going to be? You can click on subscribe. You can find all the ways to find this show. So if you're listening to an RSS, you want to get us on Pocket Cast or YouTube or TuneIn, Google Podcasts. You want to yell at your tubes in your house and have the have the speaker play the stuff. Just yell at it. Hey, so-and-so. Hey, G-Man. Hey, Echo. Play the latest Miami Vice podcast. Just yell at it. Go in other people's windows. Just scream it into their house. They will appreciate it when they hear our great podcast of Miami Vice. Just do us a favor. Go ahead and do that. The second favor you can do for us, go review our podcast on your podcast, your platform of choice, especially iTunes. If you happen to listen to us through the Apple podcast, go there and leave a review. Just give us five stars. Go ahead. Just give us all five stars. No one will even know that I asked you to do that. But don't write a review. No one ever reads the reviews to the show. Instead, pick your side. Team Blue, Team Red, Team Cap, Team Iron Man, Melissa or John, <laughs> whose side are you on here when it comes to gun placement? Was it planted or did Hackman have it the entire time? Go ahead and write that in your review. Support step number three that you can do for us is check out that Patreon, patreon.com slash go with the heat. If you ran into us at an airport and you would buy us a beer, that's $15. You support us a dollar a month on Patreon. That's $12 a year. Your boy Dominic's got your back. He's saving you $3 a year by supporting <laughs> us on Patreon. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see y'all next time. Bye, pals.